Military murder is an independent project and is not endorsed by the Department of Defense or any military component. The views expressed are those of the host. The content of this podcast is not meant to be legal or medical advice. Warning. This episode contains graphic details of murder and is not suitable for young listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome back, True Crime Army, and thank you so much for tuning in again. I am your host, Margot, and this is a true crime podcast where I focus on murders committed by people in the military and veterans. But don't worry, you don't have to know anything about the military to listen. I promise. You just have to be a true crime enthusiast. And if that's you, welcome home. All right. So I just want to give a quick shout out to today's producer, which is Tony Crutchfield. She sponsored last week's episode as well. And I just want to say thank you to her. And I just want to say, Tony, I hope that you are enjoying the beginning of your retirement. All right, True Crime Army, I have had a heck of a week. Last week, after I released two episodes of Military Murder, my entire house was flooded. (laughs) Uh, It's a long story, but it was flooded due to a pest control guy's mishap in my attic. Anyway, it was a complete nightmare. I'm in a hotel room right now recording. So if it sounds different or doesn't sound as good as usual, that's why I'm literally recording in a a hotel room right now. So I want to tell you guys what happened and how my week was, but I don't want to waste anybody's time who doesn't want to hear. So if you're interested in hearing that story, stay tuned after the credits and I'll discuss more about my life in the last week. Um, And, you know, that way, for those of you who don't want to listen, you can just completely skip it. Okay. Also, I am going to be changing the format of my show just a little bit from now on. If you contribute to the Military Morale Fund, I normally do the shout outs in the beginning, but I'm going to be moving that the shout outs and everything to the end of the show. Everyone stay tuned because at the end of the show, I normally do shout outs for people who leave reviews on Facebook or CastBox or even Stitcher or Facebook. So I do that and I also give whatever updates I need to give. Don't forget to sign up for the True Crime Army Bulletin, aka the newsletter. There is a bonus episode for those who sign up and it's the case of Lorena Bobbitt. All right, now, without further delay, let's get to today's case. Join me today as I discuss a serial killer that's not as infamous as most. He's no BTK, Jeffrey Dahmer, nor Ted Bundy. Nor did he reach the magic number of three murders to make you a serial killer. But you may want to be careful because the killer genes run deep in this guy's veins. Today, I am discussing Ward Weaver Jr., a Vietnam veteran with enough mental health issues to make your head spin from all the differing diagnosis that this man received. But today's episode is special because it's a collaboration between Military Murder and Wife of Crime. And the case was chosen by Jess. I'm bringing you part one and Wife of Crime is bringing you part two. So it's a twofer. And don't worry because part two is also a military murder case. Today, if you listen to this when my episode comes out on Monday, then you'll have to wait until Wednesday to hear part two. But if you're listening a few days after I release the episode, then immediately after listening here, you can head on over to Wife of Crime to pick up where I left off. Let's just say it's a family affair. Now, let's discuss a veteran who almost got away with the murder of an airman and his fiance, except he enjoyed talking a little too much in jail. And it finally caught up with him. But don't be fooled. There may be a dozen more murders in this guy's background that we don't yet know. Now, let's dig in. Before I begin, I would like to thank one of my listeners, Uda Loop, for helping me with the research in this case. My resources for this case were the 2001 California Supreme Court opinion in People vs. Weaver, the Times Standard, the LA Times, the Sacramento Bee, and the Tennessean Sun. I also watched a very good episode of The Evil Kin on Investigation Discovery that discussed this case. Ward Francis Weaver Jr. didn't have an easy life growing up. He was abused as a kid by both his mother and his father. But his mother, Dorothea, she was the main abuser. Some of the punishment used against him included his mother biting him until he bled when he misbehaved. 
she had a huge hatred for men. So she told her sons that they should all be castrated. And to make matters worse, Ward's mother also forced him to sleep in the same bed as her until he was grown, including on Ward's wedding night. As a young boy, Ward enjoyed torturing animals, but he also tortured his sister. Ward's sister said that when she was six years old, he purposefully cut off her finger while playing with a hatchet. A year later, he tied her to a tree, tied a noose around her neck, and then left her there for a while, hours, before finally coming back and untying her. When she was nine, he raped her with sticks. And then when she was 12, he raped her with his penis. And his favorite animal to torture were cats. He'd rub sandpaper on the cat and then pour turpentine on it. Ward felt zero remorse. Ward served in the army as a combat engineer beginning in 1967 and went to Vietnam from 68 to 69. Before he left to Vietnam, though, he didn't think that he was going to return. So he gave away some of his most prized possessions to his cousin. And according to court records, at some point in Vietnam, he handled the transportation of prisoners. Ward married his first wife, Agatha, when he turned 18 years old, but he continued to live at home, even though he was married. Ward's mother made sure that the couple lived in hell. Agatha gave birth to three kids, including Ward Weaver III. By the time the couple had been married for six years, Agatha was tired of the living arrangements in the situation, and she divorced Ward and took the kids. Ward was 24 years old and free from his wife and three kids, and he didn't bother keeping tabs on his family. They were as good as dead to him. Eventually, Ward remarried. By this point, Ward took a job as a long haul truck driver. He enjoyed the isolation. He was a man tortured by his upbringing and then the things that he experienced in the military, he just preferred to be by himself. In September of 76, Ward discovered that his wife was seriously ill, although I haven't been able to find anywhere exactly what her ailments or her ailment was. But Ward was upset by the news and he was also upset because he was having some issues at work. So he decided to go on a bender. He went to a local pub and drank his sorrows away. And then he relocated to another bar where he got into a physical altercation with a man. Then Ward began to realize, dang, this night isn't going to end well. He could just feel the anger or whatever it was like swelling inside. So he walked on over to the police station wanting to turn himself in before he committed any crazy crimes. But then he knew he just stood there and he knew it was a joke. He, he'd have to actually commit a crime for the police to care. So that's exactly what he did. On September 22nd, 1976, in Eureka, California, it was about midnight. As Ward looked around, he spotted a young girl. Her name was Bonnie Brown. She was leaving her job at the bowling alley. And as soon as he saw her, he pulled up to her in his truck. And he asked her if she knew about any local shops that were open at this hour. And they got to chit-chatting. And then he invited her to join him. And Bonnie agreed. They were heading to a Denny's. But before they went there, he was like, come on hey, do you want to come see my big rig at the truck stop? And for some reason, Bonnie agreed. Bonnie took a look at the truck and then on her way back to her car, Ward struck her over the head with a bat. He covered her mouth and told her, I will kill you if you don't do as I say. Then he shoved her into his truck. And as he proceeded to walk around the truck to get into the driver's side, Bonnie got the heck out of the car and not only ran like the wind, she screamed like hell into the restaurant. Ward sat there, dumbfounded. Um, that wasn't planned. He tried to speed off, but not before some quick patrons took down his license plate number and called the police. So true crime army, this moment calls for another true crime army rule. And it's taken directly from a few survivors that we've heard about in these episodes, like the story of BTK and the story of the taxi cab murders where potential murder victims actually got away. And here it is. This is a new true crime army rule. Ready? If you're being attacked, scream like hell and run like the wind. This usually tends to shock the perpetrators because they think that they are going to overpower their victim. But when their victim fights back or they do this or they try to get away, sometimes they're successful. Now, I'm not an expert on on safety, 
but that is a new true crime army rule. Due to the license plate information and Bonnie's identification of Ward, after Ward took his family out of town for a few days, Ward decided he would eventually turn himself in because he knew they were looking for him at that point. And and if he didn't turn himself in, somebody was going to turn him in. Interestingly, when he was questioned, he really didn't mind talking about what he did. In fact, when they asked him, what was your plan with the girl if she hadn't escaped? He literally said, quote, "Mm, I probably would have raped her and might have killed her, end quote. Not surprisingly, he was charged with attempted murder, assault, and attempted kidnapping. Ward took a plea deal where he pled guilty to assault and the attempted murder charges were dropped and Ward was sentenced to three years in prison. Now, part of his plea deal included taking a lie detector test. And during this lie detector, the cops took advantage and they began asking Ward, because remember, he's a a long haul truck driver. They began asking him about unsolved crimes involving female hitchhikers along his or along his path. And he didn't admit to much, but he did admit that a year earlier he had raped a woman, but he thought that she never reported it. And he denied ever raping anyone or ever murdering anyone. Ward did his time for his offense against Bonnie, but once he was released into society, he would be up to no good all over again. And I should know that it does appear that Ward sought help with the VA hospital, but they turned him down due to a space availability issue, which is which is really sad when you find out what he does next. In April of 1981, there was a young couple, 18 year old David Galbraith and 15 year old Michelle from Burlington, Washington. Well, they were trying to skip town because David had burglarized a few things from an outdoorsy store before they went on the run. And, you know, hitchhiking was big in the 80s. And so this young couple, they were they were hitchhiking. So they they burglarized the store and then they're hitchhiking across, you know, cross country or whatever. So as they were hitchhiking, they're trying to get to Wairika, California. And Ward Weaver Jr., remember, he's a truck driver. He stopped and he asked David and, and Michelle if they needed or wanted a ride. And the couple was like, OK, cool. Yeah, let's let's get a ride with this guy. When they jumped in, Ward had his 10 year old son in the truck as well. So David and Michelle, they were like, OK, this guy has a kid. I'm totally safe here. Well, Ward took the couple to Wairika, which is where they were going. They were intending to go hang out with Michelle's uncle for a few days. But when Michelle got there, her uncle wasn't there. And it was going to be about two weeks before he returned. So Ward was like, you guys are welcome to come back to my place. And the couple thought, wow, this guy is so sweet, so kind. The young couple ended up going back with Ward and hanging out with Ward and his family for about two or three days. And remember, they were running away. So Ward offered them another ride and they agreed. And and he also said, hey, I can help you guys make money and get a job. They arrived in Ventura, California, where Ward introduced David, the the young 18-year-old guy, to a man named Gerald Daniels. And he said, hey, don't worry, you're in good hands. Gerald is going to help you find a job. Actually, go with him now. Michelle can stay with me, but go with him and he's going to help you find a job. Well, Gerald and David, they left on their own, but not too long after, Gerald shot David in the head twice and then in the face with a gun that he got from Ward. Then Gerald pushed David down an embankment and left him there for dead. But David wasn't dead. One of the bullets entered through one cheek and exited the other, and the two headshots, they were lodged in his head and never penetrated his skull. He was so lucky. But David was a survivor, shot in the head three times, He managed to crawl up the embankment and back to the street to get help. Meanwhile, Ward had taken 15-year-old Michelle, his intended target after all, and raped her at gunpoint. Then he forced her to perform oral sex on him. He forced her at gunpoint and then he told her that if she didn't obey, he was going to kill David. And then Ward took Michelle to his house. Now, it's unclear who, if anyone, was home. But then Ward dropped her off in town about 5 p.m. and told her to be back there at 9 p.m. Michelle was terrified. She didn't want anything bad to happen to David. So she waited till 9 p.m. without getting help. But when Ward didn't show up, she finally went to the police. 
Now, Ward was still a long haul truck driver. And once a BOLO report came out, which is BOLO stands for be on the lookout, Ward was arrested at an Oroville truck stop and he did not even put up a fight. He was charged with false imprisonment, rape and accessory to attempted murder. When it comes to vitamins, we all deserve to be a little bit of a skeptic. And if you are, that's a good thing, especially when it comes to vitamins, which is why I choose to take the Ritual Essential for Women 18 Plus multivitamin. Ritual created a clinically backed multivitamin for women who are 18 and over. Ritual's multivitamin supports brain health, bone health, blood health, and provides antioxidant support. And above all else, Ritual has traceable key ingredients in clean bioavailable forms. I've always, or almost always, been a vitamin consumer, but I never liked the taste, chalky and honestly just nasty. I often wondered what all those ingredients even meant on the label, but I figured, hey, I needed the vitamins, so I just put up with the horrid taste and the ingredients I couldn't even pronounce. But that is now an issue of the past, ever since I found Ritual, because Ritual comes packed with nine key nutrients in two capsules per day. So you can take your vitamins and relax knowing that you are in good hands. Another thing is that Ritual is packaged in a minty capsule that will leave you feeling refreshed. I've been using Ritual Essential for Women for two months now and I couldn't be happier. So listen up, no more shady business. Ritual's Essential for Women 18 Plus is a multivitamin you can actually trust. And right now, Ritual is offering my listeners 10% off during your first three months. Visit ritual.com slash military10 to start Ritual or to add Essential for Women 18 Plus to your subscription today. He was ultimately convicted and sentenced to 42 years in the San Quentin prison. Gerald, the triggerman, was also caught and convicted and he was sentenced to 38 years and eight months. Well, it was during Ward's long stint in jail that things really got interesting. In May of 82, Ward befriended another inmate named Ricky Gibson. For my military friends, have you ever noticed that us military folks, we talk like we are serving out a prison sentence when we talk about our time in the military, for real. Uh, I woke up the other morning and it dawned on me. When we meet other military folks, we say, how much time did you do? Or if you're still serving, they say, how much longer you got? (laughs) It's so freaking funny and insane, kind of, you know, sad, but but still insane. Now, listen, no one take offense to this. It's just cold, hard facts. Whenever you meet anybody, actually, whenever I get emails or messages from folks, it's always like, you know, how much time did you do? Or, or, you know, how much time do you have left or things like that? And I think it's, I think it's kind of funny. And then also, you know, we, we serve our, um, over here, recording our prison sentences in different bases, right? So if you're in, in the army, you would say, you know, oh, I was at Fort Polk or, If you're in the Air Force, you will say I was at um, Minot Air Force Base or something like that. So it's just it's just really funny where where us military people serve our time, a.k.a. serve our sentence. But anyway, Ward ended up befriending Ricky in jail and they were probably chatting about how much time they did, how much longer they had. And they got to talking about life outside of jail. Well, as their friendship grew, Ward began to confide something very serious with Ricky. Ward told a crazy tale. He told Ricky that one day he beat an Air Force airman named Robert Radford and that he also took Robert's girl and did her in. Well, Ricky was like, wait a minute. I may have some information that may get me released from this joint early. So he went and ratted on Ward. But you know what? Good on you, Ricky. The police had this information and they couldn't just willy nilly take an inmate's word for it. So they went digging for any unsolved murders of airmen in the area. And sure enough, a young 18 year old airman had been murdered on February 5th, 1981. And the murdered man's girlfriend, 23 year old Barbara Ann Lavoie, well, she had been missing ever since Robert was murdered. So let me take you back to February 5th, 1981. It was late 1980, early 1981, an 18-year-old Robert Radford was at Air Force basic training in Colorado. While there, he met 23-year-old Barbara Lavoie. 
They were smitten. And as soon as boot camp was over, Robert told Barbara that he wanted her to meet his parents in Washington state. So together they took a road trip. It appears to me that this was one of those military, let's meet the families to see if you mesh with my family so that we can get married type of trips. And you know, if you're in the military or married to the military, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Don't act like you don't know, okay? After heading up to Washington, they made their way to Pinedale, California to meet Robert's grandma. The plan was to go to Edmonds, Washington, then California, then make their way to Robert's first duty station, Nellis Air Force Base in Nevada. And then Barbara would take a flight from Nevada back to Colorado. So after visiting Granny in California on February 5th, 1981, Robert and Barbara hit the road about 7 p.m. heading towards Nevada. A few hours into the road trip, they had car trouble. So they pulled off the side of the road. And at about 11 p.m., a man named James Powell saw the couple's emergency blinkers on. And he stopped, asked the couple if they needed a ride. But the man was heading in the opposite direction. So the couple actually declined the ride. Little did the couple know that they were being preyed on by another man who saw them on the side of the road. Soon after James Powell continued on his way, another man stopped to help the couple. And that man, Ward Weaver Jr., About an hour earlier, Ward had seen the stranded couple on the opposite side of the road, but he kept on driving. Now he was in his big truck. He got off the exit and he made a U-turn. And then as he approached the couple, he pulled over and asked them if they wanted a ride. Well, since he was going in the same direction as the couple, Robert and Barbara accepted Ward's ride. The three of them drove off for about five miles or so when Ward suddenly pulled over and asked Robert for some help shifting the load in the flatbed of the truck. So Barbara stayed in the car and Robert and Ward got out of the car. As Robert and Ward were in the back, Robert turned his back and Ward took a cheater pipe and whacked Robert right in the back of the head repeatedly over and over and over again. Now, for those of you like me who don't know what a cheater pipe is, check out my sources page because I include a picture because I had actually no clue. But a cheater pipe is basically, it basically looks kind of like a wrench, but the handle for this cheater pipe is about three or four feet long. It's a tool that truckers use to, I guess, help leverage tightening or loosening any type of nuts and bolts. That is probably wrong. I read that and I just summarized what I read. But either way, he it, it was like this three to four foot tool. Ward left Robert on the side of the road and quickly jumped into his truck where he brandished a knife and told Barbara to shut up and put her head between her legs and her arms behind her back. Now, Ward would later say that he learned this technique from his time in the military when he was in Vietnam and transporting prisoners. Once Robert was no longer in the car, Ward took off and made a U-turn and then he pulled over and raped Barbara. Then he continued his journey, but then decided to stop and rape her again. Poor Barbara. She must have been absolutely terrified. Now, mind you, Ward has Barbara, but Robert was back on the side of the road laying, probably dying. But it was dark outside, so it might be a while till someone saw him. Well, someone actually spotted Robert and they immediately called for help. First responders arrived to help Robert, but it was far too late. And Robert died on the way to the hospital. He never made it to his first duty station. At the scene, police can tell that this was a brutal attack. There is blood absolutely everywhere. Now, Robert had a wallet on his person and he was quickly identified. The investigators realized as they were putting two and two together that Robert was the owner of the car a few miles back on the road, which is which which was the crime scene. Well, when they search the car, they see some women's items, including a purse and women's clothes in a suitcase. And they begin to surmise that there's a woman who's no longer here and she must be in danger. So once they find her ID in her purse, they issue a bolo, be on the lookout for Barbara Lavoie. They have a sixth sense that she is in grave danger and she surely is. Now, by this point, Ward, he had to deliver a load in his truck 
he stopped in San Francisco to drop it off and it was about eight in the morning. So he still had Barbara with him in the truck. He told Barbara to sit on the floor while he made his delivery and he told her to be quiet. And then he was gone for 45 minutes and Barbara didn't even try to leave. She just sat there absolutely terrified and shocked. Eventually, Ward returned to the car and not too long after, he was stopped by a police officer, a California highway patrolman. Again, Barbara didn't make a sound and she just sat there even though there was an officer just a few feet away who might be able to help her. Well, the police officer found that everything checked out and then he let Ward go. After the police incident, Ward didn't want to take any chances, so he headed towards his house in Oroville. But before getting home, he pulled off and told Barbara to get out. By this point, Barbara had been held at knife point for 24 hours. Ward tied Barbara's hands and feet with electrical tape, and then he attempted to gag her. But when he tried to gag her, Barbara bit his finger as hard as she could. This infuriated him, so he then strangled Barbara with a diaper. Then he buried her body. After this, he went to pick up his wife, who was working a late shift at a restaurant. Now, all of these facts, they're all taken directly from the facts section of the California Supreme Court opinion. And I found it odd that in the opinion, it said, quote, it was suggested Ward move the body, end quote. What? 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 Who suggested this? And why didn't they say anything? That really shocked me and scared me to the core. Anyway, Ward, after he picked up his wife from the restaurant, he took his wife's car, returned to the place where he had buried Barbara. He exhumed her body and then he took her to his house. When he got home, the three kiddos, they were still awake and wondering why daddy's thumb was bloody. Well, he made up some bogus story about how he got into a fight with some dude and told him, hey, stay in the house because that guy may come looking for me. Then Ward snuck outside, took Barbara's body and buried her in a pre-buried spot in his yard. Now, listen, for the last several weeks, Ward had been digging various sized holes in his backyard that he was he was actually putting some sort of sewer line in. But when he would go on his long hauls, he would tell his 10-year-old son to keep digging the holes while he was gone. Well, that night, Ward's job was done. But a few weeks later, he would exhume Barbara's body yet again and put her in a deeper, more secure grave still in his backyard. But this time, he built a wooden platform so that his wife had a dry spot to stand on when she was hanging the laundry in the yard. Oh, how sweet. Little did Mrs. Weaver know, or did she know more? She was standing on a woman's grave. After Robert's murder and Barbara's disappearance, the cops were stumped. Like, who did this and where is Barbara? When police received information from Ricky, it was their only lead. They had nothing. So Ward was in jail for rape and some other related offenses against David and Michelle. So investigators, they went to his house to speak to his wife and his son, and they obtained consent, searched the yard, and sure enough, when they dug, they found the remains of a female. The body was so badly decomposed. By this point, it was like one or two years later that the body had to be identified through dental records. And sure enough, it was Barbara Lavoie. Ward had some explaining to do. When investigators interviewed Ward, he was willing to talk. He's always just chatty Kathy. And talk he did. But first, he needed to talk to his mom. <laughs> He told the story that you already heard and even drew a map of the first place where he buried Barbara before relocating her to his backyard. Ward was charged with the double murder of Barbara and Robert and Ward testified on his own behalf. He said at some point he began to abuse amphetamines hardcore. He used them as a long haul truck driver to stay awake. And on the day of the double murder, he had taken some. And in fact, he hadn't slept in a week by that point. Oh, and he also told a tale of the voices in his head, the good and the evil. 
The good voice was some chick named Liddell, and she had been around since he was 17 years old. Now, the evil voice, a.k.a. the male voice, he didn't join the party until 68, 69 when Ward was in Vietnam. Now, the male voice had never let him down, always kind of protected him, kind of like a lucky charm. When the police asked Ward why he stopped to help the young couple in need, talking about Robert and Barbara, Ward responded, quote, Meh, I had some time to kill, end quote. <laughs> Come on, Ward. Why would you say that at a murder trial? It makes no sense. Well, on the day he picked up the young couple as they were driving, Ward noticed how cute Barbara was and he was immediately aroused. The male voice began to tell him, dang, she's cute. You should have sex with her. Liddell, the good voice said, calm the heck down, male voice. Leave the girl alone. But the male voice kept insisting, Ward, do it, man. You won't get in trouble if you rape her. So Ward testified, quote, I just couldn't go against him. I had to go along with what sounded like the most logical thing to do, end quote. Ward said from that point forward, he did what the male voice told him. In fact, he said that he didn't think Robert would die after he hit him with the cheater pipe because in 77, he assaulted someone with that same cheater pipe and they were just fine. And then, you know, most defendants with diarrhea of the mouth, he testified, if I wanted him dead, I would have knifed him or I could have used another more silent way of killing and then he mentioned about all the different ways he learned to kill while he was in the military. Basically, the reason he had to keep hitting Robert was because Robert started screaming when he hit him the first time. Duh. When you hit people, usually they scream. Once Ward got in the car with Barbara, the voices in his head were in a full blown argument. But again, the male voice reminded Ward, don't forget to have sex with the girl. And of course, Ward could not disobey the male voice. Ward went on to say that he didn't mean to kill Barbara, but that after she bit him, he blacked out and must have strangled her. And then the male voice told him to get rid of her body. At trial in the 80s, there was a lot of back and forth about Ward's mental capacity. The court opinion is over 39 pages long, and there were so many mental health professionals involved in this case that it makes you wonder what is really going on. If you need that many mental health professionals, he probably has a mental health issue. Some doctors said that Ward had schizophrenia, while others believed he only had a personality disorder. Yet others said he had post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. Well, one health professional said Ward has, quote, 30% schizophrenia, 30% PTSD, and 30% child abuse, and the rest amphetamines and sleep deprivation, end quote. To me, that just sounds like a recipe for disaster. Ward argued that the reason he spoke to police back in the 80s and confessed was because he said police threatened him with arresting his then 12-year-old son, and he also feared, he feared for his son because his son had actually helped him dig the grave. After all of the evidence was presented, Ward was found guilty of murder and sentenced to death. But do you guys remember a few episodes back when I told you that California, where the California governor has put an end to the death penalty in California, at least until someone new takes over? Well, Ward Weaver Jr. is now sitting in jail for life, even though he was at some point on death row. One of the most shocking things about this case was that before the verdict, Ward's defense attorney proposed that if the prosecution removed the death penalty from the table, Ward, quote, could clear up a lot of other cases, end quote. But the prosecution said, nah, we're good. According to an article in the Tennessee and Sun by Hotz and Johnson, the California Department of Justice once checked Ward's truck logs against unsolved homicides around the state. They came up with 26 matches, meaning that Ward had been in the area when a killing occurred. What? Do you guys get that? That means that there's 26 unsolved cases along the same route that he used to drive at the same time that he drove those routes. So it's possible that there's a connection, but they've never been able to connect 
in directly to those cases. I would say that a new true crime army rule should be don't ride with strangers. But you know as well as I do that this is moot nowadays. I saw a meme not too long ago that said, my mom told me to never get in cars with strangers. Now I have an app on my phone that tells them where I live and want time to pick me up. <laughs> Am I right? Come on, Uber and Lyft. It's funny, but scary all at the same time. One more thing, the Weaver Jr. apple didn't fall too far from the tree. According to a Bakersfield Sun 2014 news article, Weaver Sr. was not much of a saint. Ward Sr. raped his own daughter and molested his own granddaughters. When I talk about his granddaughters, I mean Weaver Jr.'s daughters. And this leads me to remind you all not to forget to tune in to part two of this episode on wife of crime, because like father, like son, let's see what crazy stuff a man by the name of Ward Weaver III could have possibly gotten into. And that story is crazier than this one. It's so sad that in this case, we have an army veteran who killed a fresh faced airman and his girl. Ugh. All right, just a reminder to stick around after the credits to hear about my crazy week if you want. Also, I'm taking the next two weeks off and I'll be back after this short break with some new military murder stories. I just have to get my house in order. In the meantime, be sure to drop by the merch store and pick up your favorite designs. You can put the military murder logo on a mug, a t-shirt, or you can get yourself a phone cover. There's so many designs on there, guys. I will continue to post in these next two weeks on social media, Facebook and Instagram. You can find me on Instagram at Military Murder Podcast, on Facebook at Military True Crime, and on Twitter at Military Murder. Okay, time to acknowledge my loyal listeners who are always giving positive feedback, positive vibes. Your positive vibes give me positive vibes. There's a few negative vibes out there, but whatever, I just ignore those. Okay. So last week I said I was going to start with Facebook reviews, but I'm actually going to start with CastBox. CastBox, if you listen on there, I know there's a ton of people who go on there and they leave reviews for the episodes or just the show in general. Well, Ruben Lucas Mia, he's always on there commenting on each episode and I know that he waits patiently for a new episode each week. So I just want to give Ruben a shout out. Thank you so much for being a loyal listener and always being on CastBox, leaving reviews and everything. I truly appreciate it. Sarah King, she's also on there. She left a review recently. She's a huge true crime fan and she often hears stories that are repeated over and over again across different podcasts. And she's excited because Military Murder offers another branch of true crime that hasn't been overplayed. She says she loves the storytelling and she also loves my side notes. Thank you, girl. All right. Jill Mortensen from Idaho. Hey, from Idaho. She came online a few months ago and she said that she downloaded all the episodes. So I hope that she's caught up. And also Devera Howard, she said that she loves the show. She's been saying that military members are normal, flawed humans, just like all humans. And she says that she's a loyal listener. Tiffany W. and Mary G., they say that they love the podcast as well. Shout out to everyone on CastBox. I'll get to a few more later in another episode. I want to give a shout out to my Facebook supporters who left a review on there recently. Uh, Deborah R., Crystal and G., Amanda S., Sarah G., Brianna W., Gian. I'm not sure if it's Gian or Jehan or Jean S., Emily W., Lynn R., Lauren D., Jeff H., and Kim B., all amazing reviews from you guys. Thank you so much. I read them. I try and like them and comment on them. So thank you so much. Um, Kim B, she had a funny one. Uh, she just posted the other day. She says uh, hers. I'm going to read hers. It says um, uh, she wrote, quote, I got hooked like morning coffee. Then I got my coworkers hooked. We are all in the military. And when we had to do site visits or take long drives to other units, they always asked me to play it in the car or on my phone in the office. Thanks for doing what you do so well, end quote. Kim and Kim's coworkers, thank you so much. Thank you all for listening. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Without listeners, I would literally just be a crazy lady talking to myself into a microphone. Now, because of you, all of my listeners, I'm just a crazy lady talking to myself into a microphone with people who listen on the other side. (laughs) Oh man, oh man. Okay, I'm not crazy. I'm not that crazy. I'm a little bit crazy. You gotta be a little bit crazy to do, 
to do this, right? To do this podcast. Okay, seriously, to everyone who has left a review or sent me a kind email, thank you so much. This episode was created by Mama Margot Productions, research help by Uda Loop, produced by Tony Crutchfield, and the music was created by Tyops. Please check out the show notes for a direct link to my sources page on my website. Until next time, remember, you never really know what someone is capable of, so remain vigilant always. You have a fabulous week, and I'll keep digging to bring you another military murder story next week. Podcast. All right. For everyone who is still around, welcome to Mama Margot After Dark. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. So basically, this week has been absolutely insane. And I just wanted to share my story with you guys because, you know, in times of quarantine, sometimes we can we can be miserable with other people, or we can hear other people's misfortune and kind of realize how lucky we are. And even with all this craziness, I realize how lucky I am. So last Sunday, not yesterday, but the week before that, I had my sister come out. So for you, those of you who don't know, I have two little girls and my husband and I are both, we're both in the military and we've been working from home. And it's been, I would say, interesting to telework with two small children, a one-year-old and a three-year-old. And so my sister came out and she was going to nanny for me. So <clears throat> she comes out on Sunday and I'm giving my daughters a bath in there. Oh, I live in a condo townhouse looking thing. And I'm giving um, my daughter, I'm brushing my daughter's hair and I hear something and everyone's like, oh, it's just the water. And I'm like, no, it's not the water. What is that? It's coming from the vent, like the, the fan vent from the bathroom. So all of a sudden everyone be, everyone's quiet. And my little daughters are my three-year-old. She's almost four. And we hear it again. And it's, it's a rodent. Some sort of rodent is in the vent, the fan vent. It's not in the vent for the the heater or the air conditioner. It's literally the fan vent. And I hear it and I'm like, ah, I'm freaking out, right? Because I hate rodents. And my daughter's like, what is that? And, and somebody says, oh, it's just a leak. And so we kind of put her back to bed. And then my husband and my sister, they go into the bathroom. because so I'm like, I am not getting near that thing. And their intent is to open the vent and the rodent. We're th- we thought it was a mouse. Um, fall in and, and they were going to take it outside. So they were all prepared and I had everything locked down. I was freaking out in my room. So they did that, but they couldn't actually get to whatever it was, but they could hear it. They could hear it. So my husband has to go to work the next morning and I wake up and first thing I do is I call, I call pest control and I'm like, okay, maybe they can get there. Maybe they can set some traps or they can do something. So they, I call them they are going to come after lunch. I let my boss know, hey, boss, I'm going to be uh, dealing with pest control this afternoon. It, it shouldn't take too long. So the guy comes on. He comes in. My husband finally got home from work after lunch. And then the, the guy comes in and he goes up to the attic. He goes up to try and, and do his thing. He goes up to the attic to lay some traps because he's not able to get the, the vent open all the way either. While he's up there, my husband and I are just sitting in the hallway. We're, we're kind of sitting nearby and we're chatting. When all of a sudden my husband goes, what is that? And we hear, and in our hallway, the sprinkler starts to leak. It's not going off. Like it's not actually going off. It's just leaking. And so I haul booty all the way downstairs because for some ungodly reason, we have 12 buckets. We have 12 of those Home Depot looking buckets in my house. And so you would think that I'm, uh, I'm Israel Keys, uh, for the serial killer Israel Keys who keeps these. But anyway, we have these buckets. So I run all the way, like four stories down to the garage to grab them. I'm on the phone with 911, freaking the heck out, trying to tell her to come, tell us, send the, send, send the, uh, send the fire department, send them fast. And it's so funny because whenever I, hear these stories about true crime and they're calling the cops and I'm like, why don't they, why don't, when they call, why don't they start with the address, start with the address so they can get people there faster. Well, I didn't even take my own advice and this wasn't even, um, you know, uh, it it was more of a house emergency than anything, but I'm telling her to come, come fast. And I'm telling her what's happening. And she's like, excuse me, ma'am, excuse me, ma'am, where do you live? And so I was like, oh my bad. So I give her my address anyway. So at the same time, the sprinkler alarm is going off over there, wherever she's at. And she's like, oh, the fire department's already on their way. So imagine we're in the middle of freaking a COVID outbreak, right? Everyone's like hunkering down at home. And here I am. I have this guy in my house who basically broke the water sprinkler and the water's coming down, right? The water is just coming down. We have buckets. We have 12 buckets everywhere. Actually, we have 13 because our neighbor gave us one. The water is coming everywhere. And then that's on the third floor. It's leaking upstairs. 
then in the kitchen, oh, my computer, not my work, not my, not my podcast computer, but my work computer, my sister's computer, it's all on the kitchen counter because that's where we were working. And all of a sudden, the, the light fixtures in my living room and my kitchen start to leak. Then there's water coming out of every ceiling fixture that you can think of and everything's just coming down. The, the fire department's not even in there, even, even there yet. And then all of a sudden the fire department comes, they're like trotting through. Right. And I'm like, Oh, well, no one has their nose covered. No one has anything covered. I'm like, Oh, well, I probably have COVID by now. Does it matter? So they come in and I live in this condominium, which you don't control the sprinkler system from your own house. It's like down the block. So they have to find it. And now, mind you, there is gallons and gallons of water coming through my ceiling, literally on every single floor. And we're just trying to stop it. We're like, I don't even know what to do. So my poor little daughter, the one that you guys always hear in the beginning of the show and at the end of the show, at this point, she already knew. She already knew that I told her that the guy was coming because he was going to take the mouse and take him back to his mommy and daddy. So my daughter's hiding behind the couch and I'm I'm like so sad. I'm like, what's going on, honey? Why are you hiding? You know, because at this point I'm thinking she's scared of the water or something. She says, mommy, I'm hiding from the mouse because remember, there's like dozens of people in my house right now just coming through and she's thinking that we're still looking for the mouse. And it's like, no, honey. Honey, the mouse, he's having a field day. He's swimming right now in my attic. He, we don't have to worry about him no more. So it was like the cutest little thing. And so anyway, eventually, I don't know, like 20, 30 minutes later, they get the water to stop. But then it's all residual water and it's just coming down in my kitchen, in my dining room, in my family area, all upstairs. My husband's closet, that that's where the guy has this, had the stairs to get up into the attic his entire wardrobe just ruined the, we have a carpet upstairs. It was all ruined. I mean, we, we were having like, you could just jump and it, like the water was above the, the ground. It wasn't even just soaked. It was just above the ground. And the guy, the pest control guy is sitting there. He's helping, you know, as much as he can. I think he's more like in shock about what happened. And eventually we have to call insurance companies and all that jazz. Eventually water mitigation comes and they basically look and they're and the, 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 the ceiling on my second floor, which is where my kitchen and my family room are. It's basically caving. It had changed. It, it's, I have the whites painted pure white or extra white or whatever. At this point they were kind of sagging. They were yellow and they were sagging. And the guy looked at us. My husband was going to, my husband was planning on staying at the house that night for whatever reason. And, and we were going to, we didn't know what we were going to do. The water mitigation guy says, uh, you guys can't stay here. It's not safe. Um, and my chandelier in my kitchen, the, the chandelier in my dining room was like eh, falling a little bit. And we're like, where do we go? Where do we go? It's COVID. You know, we have we have dozens of places of people who would love to have us over. But I mean, it's we're in the middle of a COVID outbreak. And okay, is there even a hotel that's open to let us stay? And so eventually we find this place. Um, insurance calls us USAA. They're awesome. They are able to get us a place. They put us in a two bedroom, two bath uh, hotel room. And it, it's basically when my husband and I moved in with the kids. We looked at each other and we said, oh, this kind of feels familiar. And then we laughed and we said, oh, it feels like we're, we're TDY with kids. For my civilian people who are listening, TDY means when you're on temporary duty. You, this literally looks just like it, except I've never been TDY with my children. So this is and my and my nanny slash sister. So this is quite an interesting ordeal. But. Um, I wanted to tell this story mostly because it's crazy, right? Everyone is sitting at home in COVID complaining about being in the comfort of their own home, complaining about having to entertain their kids. And I just want to say, you know, we're all so blessed. The fact, I mean, not everybody is blessed. I know a lot of people don't have a good home life and it could be very stressful. Um, but for those of us uh, like myself who count ourselves extremely blessed, I think you just have to really just think about this time as a time to just pause, you know, just pause and enjoy what you have and enjoy the fact that for those of us who are in the government, uh, we're still getting paid. You know, I mean, we don't have to go to work. We get to, we get to telework from the comfort of our homes and we still have that steady paycheck. There's so many small businesses right now going out of business. Um, but um, there's, it's just, I count myself so blessed after this was all said and done and our neighbors were sitting outside after this in this COVID thing, you know, they were nice enough to entertain my my two small children and my sister out there during the hours that my husband and I were just going through our house and trying to count the loss. When we came outside, a couple of our neighbors, they looked at me and my husband and they said, you guys are so calm. 
And my husband and I looked at each other and we just kind of laughed and we said, oh, are we? And they, our neighbors, they were like, wow, if that ever happened to us, like, how did you not flip out on the guy? And how did you not do this? And why aren't you crying right now? And I cried eventually. It took me a few days. I think I was still in shock, but it occurred to me and my husband, as we looked at each other, that the military has been extremely good to us. Every single step of the way that we have been in the military, all the training that we've had, all the deployments that we've endured, all the military moves that we've endured where some of our stuff has been destroyed. um, It really had prepared us for that very moment. And it was a moment of clarity, a moment of education where we could actually show our kids what we do every day. You know, we are, I'm not, I don't consider myself with what I do in the military. And I, and most of you know that I do this anonymous, but we're first responders at the end of the day. And it was, um, you know, sometimes life throws things at you. And I, like I tell my daughter, you can always replace things. You can't replace people. And so my family is safe. And funny enough, all my podcasting equipment was safe. (laughs) Besides my family, that was the first thing I came to check, check on. I was like, oh no, I got a new microphone. And my phone, my microphone was great. My, my computer was fine. And so I decided not to take this week off, even though everyone was like, why are you doing another episode? And I said, I I wanted to show, I wanted to do this episode for my listeners who are listening. And I wanted to give you guys a heads up that I was not going to be releasing an episode for the next two weeks because I do need to take a pause for myself and for my sanity and for my family. And also because I need to figure out um, all this insurance stuff and I still have to do my taxes. (laughs) So anyway, I just wanted to share that story and I would love, I was thinking about this the other day. I would love to do an episode of military murder, not murder, military, not murder, but just a military story. Um, doesn't have to be long, just four or five minutes. If you guys want to send me anything crazy military stories, they don't have to do with murder. They don't have to do with crime, just how the military has actually helped you. Because, you know, a lot of times, as you know, my podcast you know, I, I, I only, I only dwell on people who, who do bad things in the military, who are, who were or are military and did bad things. But at the end of the day, there's so many amazing things that the military has taught you and so many amazing people in the military and so many things that civilians, they might not have to go through. And so if you have a story like this, I don't know, maybe you could tell me about a TMO, how they ruined all your stuff or whatever, and how it was just a disaster. Maybe you cried, maybe you didn't. Um, but, you know, send those to me. And I, if I can put together, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes, I can tell your guy's story, write it out, you know, in, in a good enough format that I can just read it directly. I would love to do that for you guys um, so that we can kind of share these stories of of incidents that happen. And even my civilians, I think my civilians who have nothing to do with the military, I mean, a flood can happen anywhere, you know, a hurricane can happen anywhere, but just tell me about those times and and what you did to kind of overcome. For me, uh, my husband laughed at me because I I think it was like a full 72 hours later um, when I was sitting here in my hotel room, we hadn't really unpacked yet. Everything was unsure. They were packing our things back at the house where I literally just started crying. And my husband looked at me like, why are you crying? I'm like, I don't know. (laughs) And I think it was just, you know, it's okay. It's okay to finally, uh, emotions will catch up to you. And it it hit me, you know, as I tell all these military murder stories and true crime cases, people really do deal with things in a different manner. I, had I put myself in that situation before it happened, I would have thought that I would have been crying up and down crying, but it was too, it was too just shocking, you know, just shocking that it was happening. It was happening in the middle of, of COVID, which is so, this is something that's new. It's a new world that we're living in right now where you can't go outside, you can't play, you can't do this, you know, you can't go to the mall, you can't bury yourself in the movie theaters, which the movie theaters is my escape. Like that's where I go to kind of regroup. I love going, everyone, some people don't like going to the movie theaters alone. That's not me. I can go to the movie theaters alone any day and just have a great time, like a date with myself. That's just just who I am to kind of decompress. But anyway, that's it. And uh, if you've listened to this till now, thank you. You're probably the only person. I'm just kidding. Um, But I just want to say thank you guys so much. Really being able to put this episode together for you guys 
um, after this crazy week really is what kind of kept me going uh, without going crazy. I washed my hair for the first time a couple of days ago and it was it was so nice to kind of wash my hair. And I also I I am. Um, I'm wearing one of my one of my merch store items. It's my I love true crime podcast sweatshirt. And I just feel so cozy in it. It with, washed my hair, put on the recorder and recorded this for you guys. So anyway, I just want to say everyone stay safe out there. This COVID thing is, you know, serious. And I think we all just need to bunker down and hang tight. We're going to get through this together. And for all my military people, this is a time to just take pause and and um, and just breathe for all my first responders and for all the people who work at the grocery store. Holy smokes. You guys are so freaking important for all my target workers. Yes. Yes. I'm talking to you. If you're a target worker, thank you so much for people who work with the post office. You guys are amazing. Still dropping off my Amazon items. Yes. Thank you. Still delivering my Tee Public merch to all my listeners. Yes. Thank you so much to the doctors, the first responders, the police, the police uh, department, the fire, the firemen, the firemen who came to my house and kind of looked at me as they were just like, we're so sorry. I'm like, well, there's nothing you could do. This is, this is no one's fault. Um, you know, to the construction workers, those guys, they came to my house and they, they, they brought a team and they packed up my house. They packed up everything that could be saved. They put everything in trash bags that couldn't be saved. Those people. All those people, those are the the true heroes right now in this crazy times where everyone's bunkering down and safe at home. And these are the people who are out there helping us, helping us be okay. All right. True Guy Marmy, I'll see you in two weeks. Bye.